Yeah, um, I can record it, Heidi. Okay. okay, thanks, Lori. Perfect. We'll figure out the details later. So thank you so much. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining. So this is a joint collaboration between Agile Orlando and Coaching Agile Journeys. And so we're very excited to have Ryan here today talking about no estimates. So uh, just a little bit about Agile Orlando. It's been around since 2008 and have over a thousand members right now. And we've really been trying to put more virtual events to engage more people who can't necessarily come out uh, to the in-person events. And so if you want to know more, agileorlando.com and we're on Twitter and uh, Agile Florida Slack group and, and stuff. I'd love to see you. So thanks for showing up today from Agile Orlando folks. And of course, Coaching Agile Journeys. Uh, I guess I'm lucky to be part of Agile Orlando and Coaching Agile Journeys. And so we like to cross promote and really we're just a group of volunteers who came together to learn and grow others. And now we're a little more than two years old and Look at all the people that are joining. So excited to have you here today. Thanks, everybody who came through various channels to, to join us today. And if you really want to support um, Coaching Agile Journeys, we, um, we, we uh, pay for this all ourselves. We've got website hosting costs and Zoom costs and such. So um, buy us some coffee if you like what you're seeing and hearing today. Just one last thing that's super exciting. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Ryan in just a second. But um, our next speaker is going to be Daniel Mezik. Was your organization ready for Agile? And so uh, Daniel Mezik is an amazing person, uh, wrote a book on open space agility. So it took a bit from open space you know, to incorporate with Agile transformations. And so that's our next talk. So please go ahead and sign up if you are free then. And uh, without further ado, I, I just love to share, um, you know, and introduce Ryan, which is uh, so great that he's come here today to talk to us about a topic that many of us are so passionate about no estimates. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing, Ryan. Cool. So I will, uh, I'll start sharing. And thanks for that intro. Do appreciate it. It's been a little while since I've used Zoom, so I'm, I apologize. It's taken me a minute to, uh, to share. You see the green um, share screen at the bottom of the window there? I do. Awesome. So hopefully you can now see uh, the slides. Is that true? Yep. yep. Yes, looks great. Awesome. So again, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with uh, both groups. Sarah, you're awesome. Thanks for bringing me into this. Um, really love the Florida Agile community. Had a chance to visit uh, a few times now, and you all just have something awesome um, all over the state, but especially, you know, in the, the Tampa, Miami, North Florida, the, the Space Coast, all that stuff going on. It's, it's just awesome. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to join in and share no estimates. Um, a little bit about me. So I'm a professional scrum trainer with scrum.org. I have way too many certifications. If you ever have any questions about some of these, please let me know. I'm happy to discuss. Uh, RyanRipley.com is the website, my email, Twitter. If you want to reach out and discuss this, if you have questions about anything that I've said um, or that presented, or if you want more information about any of the Scrum stuff, please feel free to reach out. I can geek out on this stuff all day, so I'm happy to bounce emails and, and discuss. Uh, I do a podcast called Agile for Humans. So it's actually, it started as a handful of us getting together in conversations like this, just sharing ideas, a little coaching therapy. Every once in a while, Agile coaches need to, uh, to vent, and, uh, and it turned into the top Agile podcast on iTunes. And so it's something we're, we're very proud of. Um, it's turned into something pretty big, twenty five to 30,000 downloads a month. Um, a lot of people enjoy it. I think a lot of you could too, so please check it out. Let me know what you think. Um, let's skip through that. Uh, again, I really appreciate Coaching Agile Journeys and our, our partners on, uh, on this whole uh, webinar. This is an awesome opportunity and can't thank you all enough. No estimates is the hashtag. So if you, if you want to tweet something out, um, this is the hashtag. Now, I'm not responsible for what happens if you tweet to the hashtag. All right. So some of you get that joke and some of you don't. If you want to test those waters, you know, go ahead and tweet out, hey, really loving at Ryan Ripley and his no estimates talk and then see what happens. Um, you'll get some good conversations, some bad, but um, 
Yeah, that is the hashtag if you want to join the discussion. I'm just not responsible for what happens afterwards. Um, your questions are very important to me. And so at any point, um, I don't know if this is a moderated discussion, but if you want to just ask a question, stop me. I'd rather get to all of your questions during this hour than finish the slides. Uh, to me, if I can leave with every question answered, uh, that would be more satisfying, at least for me. Um, but yeah, please, please do uh, either through chat or through uh, voice, ask a question. I'm happy to stop and, and explain or discuss or, or facilitate someone smarter than me asking uh, a question or, or answering it for me. So, yeah. So, hey, um, actually, Ryan, we're using Slido for questions, so people can actually uh, type in their question, and then others can upvote. So, I really encourage either to um, to use Slido. It's a really great way of asking questions, just like a lean coffee format, where you vote, vote up on them. So, I've posted the link in the chat. Um, everybody, feel free to do that. And then, Heidi, are you going to facilitate and break in and ask the question? Yeah, one of our co-hosts will do that for sure. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So my interest in no estimates, so a lot of us come to this topic from different routes. Um, it's not just a bunch of anti-management, anti-estimation uh, zealots and fanatics. Um, a lot of us have made a, an observation, um, especially in the scrum world, where there's the same old thinking with new practices, but it's getting the same old results. And, and the way that I've kind of framed this in my mind, you know, the way that I, I've thought about Agile as I'm doing a lot of coaching and training with companies now, is the game Plinko. So I don't know how many of you are Price's Right fans, but Plinko is just, it's amazingly fun, right? It's, it's this game where you take a chip and you drop it and it goes down a pegboard and it lands on a dollar value. And it reminds me of a traditional project, right? So the board is set, the company's ready to drop their chip, the guy's smiling, everybody's happy, we have an estimate of price off to the side, we see our 300, you know, we know what's about to happen, but then we go to place our bet. And this is actually what it's like to stare down a Plinko board. You have options here. Now with the bet you're placing, you could make 10 grand, you can make 100, or you can make zero. And once you drop that chip on a traditional project, it's very difficult to actually guide where that chip's gonna go. And this is how I've always felt about traditional software development. It's always kind of given me pause where, you know, once we place our bets, once we get our upfront plan in place, and uh, we, we make that bet, man, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of pegs, there's a lot of uh, chance involved that, that really um, can impact the way that we work. This is an observation that many of us in the no estimates community have made, and it's led us to try to look at different ways of thinking. The problem though, is that we've been playing this game since the 80s, all right? The hairstyles are a little different, uh, the, the prices are a little different, the prizes are a little smaller, right? Inflation occurs, all that stuff but everybody's still happy to make this bet. And it's something that we looked at and thought, all right, there's something a little interesting here because the same old mindset from the 70s and 80s has still flown into these agile projects and transformations and initiatives and whatever you'd like to call them, and we haven't quite solved this. Uh, the idea that we're still seeking new mindsets, we're experimenting, comes from the manifesto. And so this has just been this really stark contrast, right? Same old mindset, same old thinking, but we're, supp we're supposed to be uncovering better ways of developing software. And so this has really been in conflict. Um, this is important because, and I think this is the main mindset shift that still hasn't happened yet. We live in a complex space. Many of you are familiar with Kinefin. We'll, we'll see the, the similarities here to complexity, chaotic, complicated. This is actually the Stacy diagram. We live in this complex space. More is unknown about our work than is known. Yet we're very happy to stand at the top of a Plinko board and drop a chip, hoping that it lands in the spot that we wanted. And uh, to me, this is just this really interesting mix of, of old thinking with new practice. So we need some things in place to start breaking through this. Uh, the first is, and this is where No Estimates lives. I, wanna I wanted to find up front very cleanly uh, where these ideas can live and where they don't, um, so that there's not a, lot of, uh, not a lot of confusion about where this can apply. And I think the first is, uh, we need a world where experimentation is possible. And I wanna be real clear that if you know what the outcome is, you're not doing an experiment, okay? So we need a, a situation where we're allowed to try things and we're allowed to potentially fail. Uh, and that can lead into safety. 
right? So we need the ability to take a lot of shots. We need the ability to take shots safely, right? And it, there's this arrow at the top where it's kind of pointing away from the target. You know, that one, that one's not so safe, but the rest of the shots, the rest of the shots, someone was trying to get alignment. They were trying to figure out how to hit the bullseye. And like this slide really shows, it takes a lot of effort to get that, that arrow into the yellow. And so this needs to be okay. We need the ability to actually take multiple shots and to have that safety, to have the opportunity to inspect, adapt, realign, and try again. We also need a world of continuous learning. So when we accept that experimentation is safe, uh, we're gonna have times where the outcomes that we were after or the outcomes that we, we achieve may not meet the business need or result. And so we have to learn from that. We have to take those learnings forward to make sure that we're not repeating mistakes over and over and over. Uh, finally, we have to deliver. I would argue that you're not doing Agile or Scrum if you're not shipping. Uh, whether that's shipping a learning, whether it's shipping software or value, um, if, we're not, if we're not producing and delivering, uh, no estimates is not gonna work for you. So hopefully that tees up kind of the four areas that, um, you know, experimentation, safety, continuous learning, and delivery. If those things are in place, these ideas could work for you. Um, I wanna start with what is an estimate? And this is a little harder to do um, over, over a webinar type situation, but maybe in the chat or Heidi, if there's a better way to do this, can I just get a few ideas from, from the crowd or the audience you know, what do you think an estimate is? I think you just post that in the chat. Let's see. Yeah, that'd be great. If a few of you could um, share with me what you think an estimate is. Let's see if I can get to the chat. Yeah, people are saying a slightly educated guess, an educated guess, a best guess, an educated guess, sometimes poised as more scientific hypothesis based on the prior knowledge, a forecast of what can be done, a kind of measure, comparison of what we know and what we think might happen. Right. Yeah, thanks, Heidi. I, I think those are all, the, the theme that I hear throughout is guess. And I think when we look at a lot of commonly used uh, definitions that really shines through and I think it's actually appropriate dictionary.com says it's an approximate judgment or calculation Marion Webster says to judge tentatively approximately roughly the size extent or nature um, American Heritage Dictionary again is rough calculation a judgment they even go as far to say opinion um, Johanna Rothman is one of the bravest agile authors I, I can think of she just finally comes out and says, look, it's a guess. Literally uses the word guess, in one of, and she's a prolific author, um, one of the highest selling authors in our field. And as she finally, not finally, she just came out and boldly said, this is a guess. It's how long you think, or how long or how much you think the project will take for a date or a cost. Um, even Steve McConnell, so I have a lot of respect for Steve McConnell. He wrote the Bible of, of software estimation, aptly named software estimation. And uh, he even says a good estimate is an estimate that provides a clear enough view. So what that implies is that we're not precise, that there is some opinion, there's some assumption. Uh, as Johanna says, it's guess. And so I think a lot of the answers that we gave in the chat really align to what the top thinkers in our community somewhat agree with. I think there's a reason for this, and I really wanna break this apart because there's some of you out there, I'm sure, and there's a lot of people, you know, whether I've given this as a keynote, or as a conference talk uh, to thousands of people at this point, there's always some people that are very uncomfortable with the concept of an estimate being a guess. They really get upset about that. And I wanna dispel that and kind of work through that quickly so that we can either have a conversation or, or, or get to uh, some kind of um, a consensus. The part of an estimate that I think we all agree with is the effort cost duration of the work. So I do believe that a, a development team, if we're talking about Scrum, for example, I think the development team typically has excellent domain knowledge and programming experience. So when we ask them how long would it take to build X feature, they probably know in ideal days without any interruptions, all those things, roughly what that could take. 
Now enter accidental complication. So it's code complexity of the current code base, past design decisions, team stability, technical debt, legacy code, no WIP limits, too high of WIP limits, management discipline, um, crafts, craftsmanship, size of stories, deployment pipelines, legacy code, dependence, all the stuff that makes us suck at our work, okay? These are all the things that make us terrible at our work and we're horrible at estimating the things we're bad at, all right? And so when you add in this to your estimate, this is where ambiguity comes in. It's very, very hard to, to accurately state um, how bad we are at our work. Uh, and then you have essential complications. So there is inherent difficulty to the work that is hard to measure. Uh, natural disasters, unforeseen events. I was actually working in a, uh, at a company where a tornado ripped through our, our office, like literally tore our office apart. We could see daylight through our, our walls and ceilings. We can't control that and that definitely impacted our estimates. Those things will happen. What I'm really concerned about is the middle column here. And we do a lot of talking about, we need to get better at estimation, but if you look at this equation, and if you agree with this, if you agree that an estimate is the actual work plus the accidental and essential complication, it would seem to me that if you wanna get better at estimation, we need to get better at the way we do our work. The shorter list that's in that center column, perhaps the more uh, consistent you can get at delivery. That's the argument. And so I shorten this to an estimate is really the work plus the buffer. Because that middle column, we have to buffer for the reasons that we are not so good at doing our work. Does that make sense to everybody? I wanna pause and see. There's usually some people that either have questions or, or who this is not really sitting well with. And I wanna make sure I, I create some space for that discussion or question. Are we good? We had one comment in the chat that says, absolutely well said. <laughs> Great. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I think it's good that you're articulating what that buffer is, Ryan, because it seems like when I'm working with teams, they just like add in fudge room and they don't think of all those things. Right. And at least I know I don't think of all those things. We just think, oh, we know stuff is going to go wrong. So we'll add a little bit just in case of that. But we don't, you know, think explicitly. Like that's a lot of stuff. Yeah, and this is a partial list. I think if you sat down with yeah. your team and really talked about why, why, it is, why we struggle to ship, if you're struggling, if you're not, awesome. I, I love high-performing teams as well, but if you're not where you think you ought to be or if your estimates aren't, aren't working out, I'd imagine if you built out this list, it would be much larger. Yeah, so, dude, I, I appreciate – go ahead. I, I love the concept of shortening that list. Yep. Know, I mean, that's brilliant. I yeah. certainly appreciate that. To me, it makes sense. Um, if we're going to look at getting better at our work, perhaps we should focus on the work and not the estimate around the work. So I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I think that slide that you just showed with the ones in the middle, the accidental complications, I, I don't think that sales and front end product are always in tune with that amount of complication. So what may seem easy from a business perspective, because we have domain knowledge, we have good programming experience, yep. ends up being complicated. And the question's always, why did it take so long? Why were we so far off? There's your middle column. Yep. Yeah, Jeff, that's a great comment. And uh, to me, this is transparency. This is empiricism at its finest. This is at the core of the Scrum framework. It's, a, it's at the core of Kanban. I mean, we, we are all about being transparent in the way we work. There's not always the safety to do that, which is why I really start off with safety being a prerequisite to this kind of work. Because when we decide to go in a no estimates route, which we'll get to, these kind of discussions come to the forefront. Uh, yeah, we, we struggle to hit our estimates or our dates because we have a lot of technical debt and we do not have an automated deployment pipeline. Well, the logical follow-up is, well, why don't we have that? And that yeah. can be a difficult conversation, right? Yeah, and I think a lot of times in command and control environments, this list amounts to what they consider excuses. Right? Well, so people are afraid to talk about some of these things because there's, there's not that safety to have this open kind of conversation about what it really means to, to the ability to deliver. 
I certainly agree that, that that can be the case. I think often though, so I've actually, perhaps part of my introduction, I should go into my background a little bit. I've been a developer all the way up to vice president uh, from a business perspective. And so a lot of the times what I've noticed in my peers when I'm in a leadership role is that the middle column is assumed to be in good shape. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the time it's surprising. If you were to actually go through this exercise and show this to your leadership, they would probably be surprised at a number of items on the list. So I, I certainly agree in, in command and control environments, these are seen as excuses. I've also seen that the opposite case where they were simply shocked that these were problems. Very good point. All right, so the work plus the buffer. And hopefully, um, by the way, there's a link at the end of this deck where um, you get all of these slides. So if you wanna use them, repurpose them, you're welcome to. You can even cut my name or my, my branding out of it. The, I, I want these ideas to spread. So if this helps you, if you can show this to your leadership and this helps you make progress uh, in your conversations, please use it. Hey, Ryan, we have one question that came in through Slido. Um, it says, I don't understand how size of your stories is an accidental complication. Yeah, so big things are hard to estimate and big things carry risk, right? So if I say um, I want to, let's say my feature is the ability to log into a system. That could mean a thousand different things to a thousand different people. That could be a very large story. It could be a very small story. And so when the size of the story is in question, the clarity is in question. And if the clarity is in question, we really don't know what we're doing. And the size of that work could either shrink or more often grow um, without us really being aware of that. And so the sizing of stories um, is important for a clarity standpoint. But also when we have small pieces of work that we can continually deliver, we can become more consistent in our work. When we have these massively varying sizes of stories or product backlog items or pieces of work or features, uh, the consistency becomes really difficult and the risk and complexity can, can increase. Does that help? I'm not sure who posted it, so if-, if That's right. If they'd like to follow up, I'm certainly happy to, to discuss further. I, I'm hoping that answer helps. Thank you. So with that said, perhaps another item for the chat, and I really appreciate the help from Kristen and Heidi to, uh, to facilitate this. With that all said, do estimates add value? What does everyone in the chat think? Sometimes, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Not to the customer directly, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I think it depends is a great answer to that kind of question, right? Um, but here's where I kind of que start questioning the value. Um, and I, magic numbers is where I get into trouble and... Um, I think Sarah started talking a little bit about this earlier. Now, this is not a political conversation. I don't want to get into the politics of the election. What I want to get into, though, are these confidence intervals that we sometimes add on to an estimate, right? So let's say we, we believe a feature will take three weeks to deliver and we're 80% confident that will happen. Um, the point of this, of this top item here is that, so Nate Silver, if you're not familiar with Nate Silver, he's perhaps one of the greatest um, predictors of election outcomes to ever live. His, his models accurately predicted the 2012 um, election down to a, a county or two being incorrect. I mean, it was brilliant. He gave Clinton an 80% chance of, um, an 80% chance of, of winning the election. And, uh, now we're living the 20%, whether that's good or bad. The point here is, is that 20, the 20% 20 can and will happen. And that, uh, that is something that we often don't take into account. When someone says, oh, it's three weeks at an 80% interval, that instantly turns into a commitment. But really it's a magic number validating a magic number, as if we agree that estimates are guesses. Uh, another one that I've heard is that we multiply by two and add two weeks, a very common practice. We believe the work is uh, two weeks, well, let's make that four weeks. Okay, now it's six weeks, and then we're sure to deliver. Uh, one of my favorites is, uh, and all of these are, are legitimate, where I've seen in a Fortune 500 company, all right? Someone will, will make an estimate. So they say something is two weeks. They'll add one to it, so now it's three weeks. Now take the next unit, three months, and that's how they reach their estimate. 
because that's that's how they pad it. Someone will say, uh, we had 20%, and I'll question, well, why not 40%? Oh, our business stakeholders would never go for that. Really? It's made up. It's a pad. Why wouldn't they believe that they're believing 20? Uh, another one of my favorites is Excel Gymnastics. I once worked at a company where you would input certain values like uh, the estimated duration, how many unit tests, how many QA cycles, and it would magically output an insanely padded number so that the estimate you turned in could always be right. And to me, this is not working in, a, in, a, in an empirical environment. To me, this is relying on magic numbers in order, to, um, in order to never be wrong about an estimate. This is no longer about the work, this is about uh, the meta side of, of software delivery. Uh, I'd also point out, so, so this is me, this is, this is conjecture, right? So this is, just, this is just observation. These are things that I've seen. I think if we looked in the chat or if I were to ask uh, if any of you have at least seen one of these done, most of you would say, yes, we've at least seen one of these. I would, I, I would hope that's true. If anyone strongly disagrees, uh, please let me know and we'll talk about that. But I also wanted to get back to uh, Steve McConnell. So I, like I said, I have a lot of respect for Steve and, I, and I, he's actually been on the podcast. So if you look through the Agile for Humans catalog, Steve did a great interview about no estimates, about software estimation, about professionalism in the industry. He gave a really good discussion, very fair discussion, um, and I think it went really well. I like to use his definition though. So he says that um, you know, a good estimation approach should provide estimates that are within 25% of the actual results 75% of the time. Consider that for a moment. Actually, let me propose something to you. I want you to give me $100,000, all right? And, 25, and 75% of the time, I'm either going to make you 25 grand or I'm going to lose 25 grand. All right. 75% of the time you're either, you're going to have a, 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 a $25,000 variance plus or minus. Now, according to this definition, 25% of the time I could lose all of your money. I could double your money. I could lose 10 X your money. I could, I could gain 10 X your money. Given those parameters, who in the chat would like to give me $100,000 to invest? Crickets. <laughs> Crickets, right? <laughs> but we're doing this every day in our companies. Every day we're handing uh, proposals with estimates to our leadership and asking for millions of dollars. Yet no one would actually take this deal with their own money. This is, the, this is one of the core issues that, that no estimates notice. This is one of the core things we looked at and said, no one in their right mind would spend their own money this way, yet we're doing it every day in our companies. Okay? And it's a problem because if you look, again, so let's look at, this is from Capers Jones, the Journal of Defense Software Engineering, a very reputable, this isn't the chaos report, this is, um, a very, this is a, a, a reviewed publication, you know, of the largest systems, 66% uh, experience schedule delays and cost overruns. This is not surprising, giving the world of, of estimation. Um, back to Steve McConnell, 80% of projects are late or failed. And that failure meaning that cost and or duration are not met. Um, he also went on to validate some of the findings of the Standish Group and of Caper Jones, but they're both saying that approximately a quarter of all projects are delivered on time, a quarter are canceled, and about half are delivered late, over budget, or both. So with that kind of success rate, it's amazing. Our, our instinct to not use our own money in this scenario is 100% correct based on this information. Even worse, though, and again, this is, uh, this is McKinsey in collaboration with the University of Oxford, 17% um, of large IT projects go so badly that they can threaten the very existence of a company, right? So not only are we placing these bets at work, 17% of the time we're risking the livelihoods of everyone we're working with. It's very it's kind of staggering information, staggering numbers. So why do we need estimates? So given the information we went through, any ideas in the chat about why we need them?
anybody or are we crickets again yeah uh so i'm just letting it they're coming through clients want need them uh we don't close the company uh to support decisions um some idea whether we can invest or not accountability because we love yep. poker forecasting yeah very very common answers and i actually i actually i, I agree that we need to make decisions and I think that's where estimates have traditionally come in. I, the accountability one, I'd like to talk, I love talking to people in environments where accountability is the key goal of an estimate. I really want to talk, especially if it's an agile company. And if, if you're on the, whoever put that in, if you would like to reach out afterwards, I'd love, I love talking about those scenarios to dig a little deeper. So I think accountability is very interesting. Um, and it's often conflated with responsibility. And I really love having that, that discussion. However, I think a lot of people said the business needs answers. We need to forecast. I totally agree. We're trying to make decisions. So in an agile, no estimates type of world, and by the way, no estimates is really just an advanced agile idea. It's not really the, the, the heresy or the, or the craziness that some would have you believe. All we're trying to do is make very, very small decisions frequently. And we want to use real data and working software to make those decisions. All right. So what is no estimates? We're finally to the, to the big question. Um, now that we've kind of set up the world of, of estimation and some of the premises and some of the key concepts, um, no estimates really came from three individuals, Woody Zool, Vasco Duarte, and Neil Killick. And they all have a different view of it. And so when someone's arguing for or against no estimates, it's really important to get to the context and, and really the, the type of argument they're trying to make. Now, Woody Zool would say that, that no estimates was a hashtag for um, exploring alternatives to estimates for making decisions. Uh, in other words, ways to make decisions with no estimates. And so what Woody is trying to do is live in a world where we can make decisions about software based on customer satisfaction, uh, uh, value delivery, um, and not effort and duration uh, estimates and guesses. Uh, Vasco Duarte takes a very, he takes a systematic lean approach to it. So what he's basically saying is estimates do not directly add value and are therefore waste. Uh, and from a lean sense, they technically are waste. Uh, they might be essential waste. So before people get too upset, they can, there is a, a concept of essential waste. Uh, but in this case, the argument is uh, from Vasco's perspective that they do not directly add value. So how do we work in a way uh, to reduce the estimation process or even stop it where possible. So it's, very, it's a very lean concept. Uh, Neil Killick, and uh, Neil is out of Australia. I align mostly with Neil. Actually, I, I, I align 100% with Neil. So it's not about ditching estimates. I would never walk into a company and say, stop estimating immediately. I think that's a horrible idea. I want to improve that center column that we looked at, the way that we work, so that estimates become redundant. I want to get to where we're so good as a team, as a scrum team, as a Kanban team, as whatever team or, or framework or practice we're using, we're so good at delivering small increments of software frequently that estimation is no longer the key discussion. The cons, the, the cons, I want the conversation to shift to value what's possible customer satisfaction. Okay. Who's, I'm, I'm hoping, again, sorry for the, the lack of interaction on this, um, you know, The Farmer's Almanac. Uh, this is a book, if you're not familiar with The Farmer's Almanac, this started with Benjamin Franklin. Um, very, very old book. They've been doing this for hundreds of years. And essentially, it's, an, it's a uh, prediction of rain for farmers, right? So on any given day, is it going to rain or not? And what's interesting to me, they, I did some research on this because the, you know, being from Indiana, the farmer's almanac was always on you know, parents, grandparents, great grandparents shelf. And we always thumbed through it and thought it was interesting. Doing some research, they looked back at uh, the prediction versus the actual for the last 100, 100 or so years from when they tracked these, these events. And it turns out you're better off flipping a coin than actually following the farmer's almanac. And that's not surprising to me. The Farmer's Almanac for, let's say, 2018 was actually written and completed uh, in June of 2016. So it's basically an 18-month cycle to get a book out the door. So that means they were predicting rainfall for 2018 in the middle of 2016. 
sounds like a lot of waterfall projects that I've worked on in the past where we're going to spend, you know, a number of months coming up with an 18 month plan for a project. We're going to follow that straight to the end, right over the cliff. You may as well look up in the sky. If, if the farmer's almanac is, is worse than a coin flip, you may as well wake up in the morning, look up in the sky and take a guess. You're better off than following that book. I prefer this. Now I do not prefer this insane storm that, that hit Chicago recently. Um, what I prefer is the Doppler radar. I want to get new pieces of information frequently. I want to update the map. I want to update the forecast. And I want to give new information to people so that they can make different decisions. In this case, we're not leaving the house. We were going to go out that night. We saw the storm pop up on the map. We made a new decision because uh, the weather got really crazy that night. I want the same thing for our software projects. I want to work in a way that we learn things frequently, we can update our forecast frequently, and we can give our business partners new information as it emerges and shows them the impact of the forecast, which creates an opportunity for them to make a new decision about the product. They might shrink a feature, they might eliminate a feature, they might reorder product backlog items, but we're giving them that opportunity every time we learn something new. Um, when it comes to actual estimation though, uh, this is my hero. All right, I love the count. I just want to count things. Uh, planning poker is a great, uh, great start for a team, and I would never discourage teams from that practice. I want to get to where we're slicing our work small enough that counting is effective. <clears throat> and here's why. So again, this is from uh, Bill Hanlon. So Bill Hanlon worked with Microsoft, so this is not a trivial company uh, doing these practices. He looked at 60 projects that used relative estimation. So this would be story points with planning poker. And he looked at the accuracy of the predictions compared to actuals. He then reset every story point estimate to a one and recomputed velocities um, and, and checked out the projections and compared that to actuals. There's a 3% variance in predictive accuracy between full data and just using a one. Uh, to me, that would point to story point estimation in some cases not being necessary. Uh, that if we can reset everything to a one, or if we just count the, our stories, our product backlog items in a sprint, uh, or in a product backlog, that's just as effective. He actually released Vasco, this is from Vasco Duarte, uh, used with his permission, some data on this. So if you look at um, taking Bill Hanlon's data and shifting all of the values to a one, three, or five, right? You get a release date of October 20th. If you use a one, two, and three, so basically you rescale to a one, two, or a three, it's October 14th. If you treat everything as a one, it's September 29th. Now you're within a couple weeks, uh, basically just counting stories as opposed to using other relative estimation methods. This is just a visual representation of, of Bill Hanlon's results. Yeah, the 3% variance uh, comes into play and the, the idea that we need to do story point estimation kind of fades away. But it's also predicated on everything that we've just talked about where it comes to um, working on that center column, slicing our work small, um, safety, experimentation, those things. So I want to make sure that we keep those prereqs in mind as we talk about moving to everything being a one. Um, I'd also point out for people who are really hung up on velocity, uh, Ron Jeffrey. So if you're working in an agile space uh, in any capacity, I think there's a handful of people that, who are probably responsible for all of us being able to work in this way. Um, Johanna Rothman, Esther Derby, um, Ron Jeffries is certainly one of them. I think Kent Beck is on that list. A lot of, you know, uh, Ken Schwaber, um, Diana Larson, a lot of brilliant people, there, but there's a handful of them who have really made our lives possible. I think Ron is certainly one of them. And when he pipes up, I tend to listen. Um, he, he is credited with creating velocity. He believed at a time that it seemed like a good idea. Um, there's been many recent tweets where he's saying it isn't. Now, I'm not saying that's not an appeal to authority argument. I think that would be a, a logic fallacy. Uh, but I would say, check out what Ron is talking about. He's done a lot of blog posting. Um, see if he can change your mind on velocity. I, I think he's been really prolific in his writing lately, and uh, he might swing you back to, to the way he's thinking. 
Uh, the reason I like count, actually, let me pause. I've said a lot of words here. And I want to, again, create some space for people to, to push back or question, because I think I've dropped a lot of information very quickly. Hey, Brian, Marcy Alfamidi here. Hey, Marcy. Hey, so I've got a team who is actually attempting to count cards now instead of estimating their backlog with story points. And I'm in support of that. But what I find is this team is able to do it because they have gotten really good and very accurate at writing stories and slicing their stories so that they're almost the same size every time they slice a story. They're yep. really good at getting the story to that, you know, what we would call a five point story or whatever. So they realized they were just pointing everything a five or an eight. So they decided why, why estimate just count cards? Um, I have other teams who I don't think are at that level yet they're not they're still they still need to get to the point where their cards are their their stories are sliced you know in a very consistent way so any thoughts on that oh i, I think your observations are spot on and we're going to touch on some of that going forward here in this talk but yeah marcy i think a lot of what you're talking about is what we've all experienced um as scrum masters and uh trainers is that Initially, we need to, story point estimation is, is a helpful tool to help teams learn the very difficult skill of slicing work into small pieces. Um, but as they get better at slicing, I think what you've observed in one of the main points of this talk is that the, the need to estimate kind of fades away. And I'd imagine, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, your teams are probably having more rich conversations about the world of what's possible and value as opposed to estimates at this point. Is that fair? Yes. Very, for that and, team. And so what has that done with the collaboration between your, your development team and your product owner or your business partners? Yeah, it's, it's definitely contributed to better collaboration and better trust even. Awesome. Yeah, I, I love hearing that. And that's really what we're after. So, but I think your observations are spot on. Teams have to, these are skills, right? As with any other agile practice, these skills, this is one of the dirty secrets that, that, we don't always talk about is that everything that we're promoting as coaches or practitioners, these are all difficult skills that take time to learn. And um, no estimates is no different. Slicing work is a skill that needs to be learned. Um, sizing, uh, and actually Marcy, I'd imagine part of your success too is that this team is actually gelling. They're in that performing stage and they're probably getting some, some time together and they're understanding how each other works. Is that fair as well? Very fair, yes. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing all of that, Marcy. I, uh, the short answer is I, I've seen many of the same observations that you're discussing and, and agree. So I really appreciate you sharing that. All right, so counting. So why I like counting. I love these cumulative flow diagrams. When I'm counting, uh, my five-year-old can help me manage an agile project. All right, we just basically count uh, where uh, the status of a, of a feature, a product backlog item is. We count it, we draw a dot, and we connect the dot to the previous one. It's really amazing how that works. It's really, we're, we're drawing lines and dots and lines and dots. But what can tell us is really fascinating, right? We can get cycle time, which is the distance from um, started to done. We can get our whip limits. We can see how much work is in process. We can find bottlenecks in our system. In this case, you know, there's some work that's backing up um, between test and done, which means we might need to talk to our development team about helping the testing team, uh, if you're structured that way, uh, get caught up. Or actually, let's write better code and prevent you know, all of these, these errors. Or perhaps we need to go to a whole team approach to, to testing, which means there's no more test or QA team. It's all one true scrum team, right? But it creates these insights and opportunities for decision and discussion just something that I really love about mapping and visualizing our work this way. Um, if you're uh, into, I really like Excel at some time, at some point, so there's a lot of great templates out there for free that you can also do this kind of mapping uh, of your work. A few scenarios here. So if you look, uh, normally I'll ask uh, audience participation here, but given our um, chat limitation, I'll go ahead and and kind of talk through this. If there's questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, work just bottomed out for two weeks, uh, and it really stumped the scrum. And these are all from real scenarios. So these are, these are scenarios that are pulled from situations that I, 
I mentor a lot of scrum masters as a professional scrum trainer. And so they've come to me with these situations. We've talked through them. You know, the one in the upper left work bottomed out for two weeks. And uh, I turned to the scrum master and I said, are you working with a European team? And she laughed and she said, yeah, she tried to trick me on this one. And uh, it turns out, you know, at least two weeks in August, all of Europe is on holiday. And so in this case, it bottomed out because of holiday and it was perfectly fine. You know, in the upper right hand corner, the lines were spreading apart pretty far and there was too much work in process. And that's what I it identified to us. And once we put a whip limit in place, suddenly done spiked way up. Teams were able to get more work, uh, the throughput improved. Uh, in the bottom left, there's a lot of work being completed from a dev and test perspective, but the, the release or the done cadence was really odd. And we realized, oh, they're, only, they're actually pushing to production every month. And we went back and talked to the team. Why aren't we shipping more frequently? Well, it turns out one of our center column items for that team was a lack of an automated deployment process. We took some time in the next sprint figured out that we needed to automate some of the deployment. Suddenly that green line met back up with the other two lines and they were shipping more frequently. Bottom right hand corner, um, we got to the end of the project and everything just spiked up to done. And essentially what happened was we hit a date, doesn't matter if it's tested, go to prod. Certainly not a professional approach uh, by any measure, but certainly a common one as well. In every one of these cases, uh, the insights from drawing a dot, connecting the dot, and making our progress and work visible in this way, and which is powered by just counting stories or counting product backlog items, created opportunities to have discussions about the work and actually helped us find ways to improve the ways we work. Um, the, what, the bottom right especially, that led to some very serious uh, introspection and some very tense retrospecting uh, but we were able to come up with ways that, that prevented this horrible situation in the future. In other cases, it led us to automate deployments. You know, in other cases, it led to a whip limit. But we had to make this work visible, and I think no estimates thinking helps us do that. I like sushi. I'm a big fan of these types of restaurants where it's, uh, the plates come to you on a train. To me, this is when someone asks me, what's a, what's a, a metaphor for Agile? I struggle. You know, a lot of people will use, um, some people will use building a house. Um, some people say it's like tending a garden. To me, it's a sushi restaurant. And from a no estimates perspective, I think this slide shows that no estimates view of Agile very well. Um, the customer is empowered at all times. We're pulling plates off of, off of the belt and we're deciding what we're willing to pay for. Um, the portions are small, so the work is in small pieces, right? There's quality control. Some of those plates are covered uh, for certain reasons, whether it's a raw fish or some other, um, some other reason. There's quality built into the process, not just at the end. Uh, a lot of different insights can come from uh, this representation of Agile. Does anything stand out to uh, anyone on the, on the call that you'd like to share in the chat quickly? Anything that I've missed that you think would uh, also represent an Agile perspective? Hmm, nothing yet. No problem. If one pops in, I'm happy to go back. Yeah, and just a, when you find a spot, Ryan, there are a few questions we, we might want to get out um, on the table, so just when you're ready. You know what? I'm, I'm happy to take those now. It lets me take a drink of water while uh, you tell me the questions. Perfect. Um, so our top question was, um, how do we prevent people from converting story points to time estimates? How do we stop story points to time? Yeah. So there's always going to be uh, that temptation, right? And I, I don't know how to control people. Uh, what, I, what I try to coach is that uh, our estimation is for capacity planning. If you look at velocity, uh, velocity is really capacity. And if you don't believe me, uh, send two developers uh, on vacation for two weeks and tell me what happens to your velocity. Simple experiment, your velocity goes down. So it's really a capacity. And so what I try to coach um, at a leadership level uh, is really around, look, this is capacity. You're not interested in capacity. Let's talk about value. And I try to do that in a very diplomatic way. Capacity is for the team. 
the team makes a commitment internally to itself. They look at their capacity. For the rest of the world, they give a forecast and they forecast frequently and they update it frequently. And that's what we share with executives along with value delivery, customer uh, satisfaction, things like that. Part of it, I think, is re-education. You know, this is just capacity. Do you really care that they have, you know, 37 work hours available this sprint or, you know, whatever you've traditionally used or are you interested in the value they're delivering? And to me, that's a coaching conversation that we try to have frequently to get them. Once you, confl once you compare velocity to capacity, that conversation typically will shift. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Yep. Any other, what were some of the others? Um, the next one was, if you don't use estimates, then what expectations would you provide the business as to when they could expect a return on the development investment? Yeah, so I'm hoping that some of the discussion we've just had um, has covered some of that. We're still providing a forecast. And we're providing a forecast frequently. What we're doing is showing real information in real time. And so as, as opposed to saying, oh, by December 16th, you're going to have, you know, a product in the market. What we're saying is by December 16th, we're forecasting the following features will be complete. Does that help you meet your value goals? So that's the, that's the new discussion. And we do that through counting. So let's, let's also, let's be intellectually honest. Counting stories and using slicing techniques is estimation. Okay. What it is though is work focused. It's focused on the feature, the story, the product backlog item, right? Because we're slicing that work down, we're, we're creating greater understanding around that work. We're focusing on the work to be done. It is through the doing of the work that we learn the work that needs to be done. It's a Woody Zool axiom that I think applies here beautifully. And uh, so yes, we are technically estimating, but the estimation is work centric. We're not trying to guess at all the accidental complication pieces and create some, some fictional value or number. Excellent. What else can I answer? So um, I, I'm gonna make it the executive decision. I think some of the questions that were posted you have answered because they're okay. kind of similar, but there are two that I think maybe you haven't, um, and I'm just gonna give them to you both at the same time. <laughs> One is, uh, would no estimates work at an epic level? And the other is, what about bugs? No estimates, I think, could work at an epic level. Um, that person is, all of you are welcome to, to reach out to me afterwards. If that person would like to email me, I'd be happy to expound on that more. Uh, what about bugs? All bugs are a one. And if we're going to have a transparent product backlog, they also go on the backlog. And if we're going to have a transparent forecast with our business partners, we're going to forecast the fact that we're actually working on bugs as well. A bug is a one. And I'm, and I'm assuming a bug is an escaped defect, not something we discovered mid sprint and that we still need to fix. So I'm assuming it's something that's come back from a customer. And in that case, it's just another, it's another product backlog item. Terrific. Yeah. I think that was very clear. Thank you. Oh, the thank you for the questions. I appreciate it, Kristen. So yeah, slicing. Question in the spike related to in the. Go ahead. There's a question um, related to that. Um, asking what about spikes? Yeah, uh, spikes are interesting. As long, but I would consider the spike a one. Okay. Right. I mean, it, we should actually. Let's keep spikes as a special case. My, my short answer, because we're running low on time, would be, yes, there are one. with That would be caveated with, we have a clear outcome for that spike. Or we have, a, actually, it's not an experiment if we know the outcome. We have, a, we have a desired hypothesis we're testing, and we've time boxed it appropriately. Now, if we have a spike that's going to take the entire sprint, yes, that's a one, but that's a different kind of one, Okay. So I just want to caveat that a little bit. Spikes are kind of that special creature. Um, I'd be happy to follow up with that person as well. So slicing is a skill, uh, and it's one that you have to learn. Uh, some people use metrics, or not metrics, heuristics. You know, let's, again, let's be intellectually honest. I think it's perfectly fine to get started with no estimates by saying, we're going to slice our work, uh, to, we're going to slice our product backlog items, our features, our stories to be one to three days. I think that's an acceptable heuristic starting out. I also think it's fine to say we're not going to have more than two or three acceptance criteria per story. The teams need to decide how they're going to heuristically slice their work. 
whatever guide they choose, inspect, adapt, improve. All right, none of this is locked in stone. We're experimenting on how to get better at a very difficult skill, okay? And eventually teams like Marcy discussed will start slicing sushi like this. And it's beautiful. I'm actually hungry. It's almost, it's lunchtime here, right? Love this stuff. Sometimes though, you end up with gas station sushi. All right, we have to watch out for gas station sushi. Now this, this can happen, especially if your product backlog is just unwieldy. <clears throat> Another question I like to ask during keynotes and other discussions, you know, and let's do this very, very quickly um, in, uh, in chat. How many of you have a product backlog item that's older than one year? So if yeah. you have a product backlog and you have a product backlog item, a feature, a story, how many of you have one that's older than a year? Definitely. How about two years? Are we seeing more yeses? Yep. 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 Lots of so in a live situation, I'll go three, four, five. We got up to nine years as the highest one in a talk. And uh, this was a keynote, 1,000 people in the room. I actually stopped the keynote, walked into the crowd, and talked to the guy for a minute. Um, I was just dumbfounded. The highest before that was four years. And the point here is, if it's older than a year, you're not going to build it. Get it off your backlog. All right? This is the, the cognitive load that you're taking on, the stress, the concern, the worry, having to refine, reestimate, resize, all that work is waste. You're not going to build it. And I promise you, if, if that feature, if it's important, it will come back, okay? So the first thing we need to do is get the product backlogs trimmed to something reasonable. Then we start refining and slicing and counting uh, because otherwise we end up with this gas station sushi. Um, I'm going to skip through that. A, a question that people ask, all right? So what they'll say is, well, how do we maintain alignment with our business partners if we're not providing estimates? Well, first of all, I hope we all understand now that we're providing a forecast frequently uh, to our business partners. But I would also encourage you to check out Luke Hoam's pattern for uh, corporate alignment and actually have an alignment meeting every at the end of every sprint, every every. Um, every month, whatever your cadence needs to be, where you actually talk about what could happen in the next few quarters. It gets features, architecture, events, schedules. Get it all. Things. We've, what I have seen from this pattern in practice, you know, our infrastructure group was planning a major um, server upgrade at the same time that we had a trade show. And if we didn't have this on the wall, they would have started this upgrade, well, potentially, while we were trying to demo product to potential customers. And so by having these collaborative sessions frequently, as we learn more information, we create true alignment. Your estimates as an alignment tool is a proxy for trust. <clears throat> you are not creating alignment with an estimate. You're not creating it. You have a proxy for trust. These exercises, frequent forecasting, frequent decision making, that's how we create alignment. There's a great Nordstrom example at ryanripley.com. There's a link to it um, in the notes. I highly encourage you to read it and check it out. Nordstrom has proven all these concepts uh, in, in their stores. So this is, this is all great theory. I certainly have some anecdotal evidence, but there's, it's also in practice with some of the large... Um, a lot of you might be feeling like this. This is my five-year-old son when I was, you know, the third time I asked him to eat at the zoo. This is the face he pulled. A lot of people pull this face at uh, the conference talks. I encourage you to um, pull, the, pull the ideas out of this talk that resonate. Ditch the rest. Perhaps they won't work for you at this point. At least consider one or two of them and give them a shot. I think experimentation is essential. It's part of our manifesto. I would love to hear back. Um, even if you're not feeling so, so great about these ideas, one interesting thing that you could try next sprint with your team. <coughs> and that leads me to next steps. If you estimate in hours, please move to story points tomorrow. Let's get out of the hour estimation. Hours imply far more accuracy uh, that we have the right to imply, especially in a complex world. If there is more unknown than known about our work, we should not be estimating in hours. Um, please do not estimate tasks. 
let's keep estimation at a story product backlog item level and higher. Um, let's limit the size of our stories. This gets, this gets us in the practice of slicing. Uh, I learned a great trick from Bob Galen. He's a wonderful coach uh, out of North Carolina. He took a planning poker deck and he threw out um, everything above a, the, the 10 or the 12. Basically, you can have a one, three, five, or an eight on a, on a Bob Galen team. And if you are higher than that, we got to slice. I love that. I love that enabling constraint because it makes teams really think about their work. So if you're... Yep. I lost audio. As yeah, well. looks like we all lost it. Oh no, Ryan, we lost audio. <laughs> it's the cliffhanger part of the show, right? <laughs> <laughs> he was saying so many brilliant things. <laughs> <It just stopped. laughs> He's oh, in a yeah. hotel, right? So he probably has no control over the Wi-Fi. <laughs> oh, right. It's possible, but he looks like he's hanging online. What? He lost the share. Yeah, he's gone. Yeah, he's gone. Okay. Whatever slides he will uh, obviously share with us and post, and the recording will be posted on coachingagilejourneys.com uh, shortly. So please reach out to us if you need anything. And uh, thank you so much for hanging in there and sharing your time with us today, Agile Orlando and Coaching Agile Journeys. Thank, thanks again so much. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks for engaging. Bye.